Sasai was a talented pilot, but during April and early May he accounted for few victories in the air, a failure stemming directly from his lack of combat experience. Nishizawa, Ota, Takatsuka and I were determined to see to it that Sasai emerged from his cocoon and blossomed into a full-fledged ace. We took special pains to teach the lieutenant the fine points of aerial combat. We spent many a long hour in our billets explaining the mistakes to avoid in the air and the means to assure a kill. Sasai especially had difficulty with adjusting his rangefinder during a dogfight, and repeatedly we went through mock battles to help him to overcome this deficiency. On May 12th we found the opportunity to test the results of our instructions. Sasai responded perfectly by scoring in a breathless diving and zooming sweep which took less than 20 seconds, three victories unassisted. We were flying near Moresby in our regular morning patrol of 15 zeros in five V formations when I sighted three Aerocobras about a mile to our right and 1,500 feet below us. Their formation was unusual. The three fighters flew in a column with about 200 yards distance between each plane. I pulled along Sasai's plane and pointed out the enemy feeters. He nodded, and I gestured for him to go ahead and make the attack. He wavered his hand and grinned, and we followed as he turned sharply to the right and dove. He hit the first Aero Cobra in a perfect firing pass. His zero pounced on the unsuspecting enemy plane from above and behind. He rolled to the right and fired his cannon as he closed in. His aim was excellent. The Aracobra burst into flames and fell apart in the air. Sasai pulled out of his dive and hauled back in a steep climb, rolling out 1,500 feet above and to the left of the second fighter. It seemed incredible, but the P-39 pilot maintained his original course. From his point of vantage, Sasai dove, rolled to the right to adjust his firing course, and raked the P-39 from tail to nose. The fighter lurched, skidded into a wild spin, and plunged for the earth. The pilot failed to get out, probably dead from the cannon shells. Sasai continued his attack in the same manner, climbing steeply and rolling over for the third attack, but the last pilot was not to be caught so easily. Even as Sasai began rolling to the right, the P-39's nose lifted steeply as the pilot began a loop, but too late, the plane was hauled up in the beginning of the loop when Sasai poured a stream of cannon shells into the fuselage and left wing. It was too much for the American plane, at the moment already under tremendous pressure from the loop. The left wing tore loose and instantly the plane whipped into a flat spin, trapping the pilot. Even I was astonished. Nishizawa grinned broadly at me from his cockpit as we rejoined the formation. Sasai was now an ace with his perfect one, two, three. Sasai's lessons for the day were not over, but it was a different and more harrowing one he was about to learn. On the return to Lei, Sasai's fighter trio moved nearly two miles ahead of the main formation. I was so pleased with the lieutenant's new status as an ace that I failed to pay attention to the widening gulf of his V-flight, a failure which had almost fatal consequences. We were crossing the Owen Stanley range, Sasai's fighters well ahead of us, when a lone Aero Cobra plunged like an arrow from a high cloud layer directly at the unsuspecting zeros, never did I regret our lack of radios as much as I did at that moment. There was no way to warn Sasai. Despite my speed of almost 300 knots with the engine on maximum overboost, I could not reach the P-39 in time to draw him off. Fortunately for Sasai, the enemy pilot did not make his attack from above. Instead, he chose the submarine approach, diving below and behind the other fighters, then pulling up in a rapid zoom and firing from below. I was less than 800 yards away when the P-39 hauled up in a screaming climb to hit Sasai from below. In desperation, I jammed down on the cannon trigger, hoping the report would warn Sasai or possibly alarm the enemy pilot into breaking off his attack. The P-39 did not waver, but Sasai finally heard the cannon reports immediately. With his wingmen hugging his own plane, he pulled up in a loop, swinging wide in a bid for height. That was enough for the enemy pilot, with three zeros in front of him and more coming up behind. He realised the danger of being trapped. The P-39 started looping over from his climb, 
ready to dive as he came out, but the initiative now was mine. I went down in a turning dive, prepared to catch the Aerocobra just as it rolled out and started to race for the earth. The pilot, however, saw me and jerked over wildly in a left roll, then dove. The towering mountains blocked his path, and even as he started to pull away from my plane, he was forced to pull up. The pilot was good. He whipped down the mountainside, turning and banking sharply as he just missed the crags and slopes, with me on his tail. Every time he turned, I cut inside the turn and narrowed the distance between our two planes. And every time the P-39 saw a chance to wing away to the right or left, he faced another zero, my wingmen, good men. We had the Aracobra boxed, he would have to fight, and he did. More than once he came around in a wicked turn as he banked to avoid the mountain, firing as he closed in. Every time he did so, I turned a little shorter, looped a little closer, and brought the firing range down. I caught him at a distance of 150 yards, firing in short bursts, closing in to less than 50 yards. The P-39 spit black smoke and hurtled into the jungle. It was a shame-faced Lieutenant Sasai who came up to my plane back at Ley. My mechanics were examining with wide eyes the bullet holes in my wings when Sasai came up to stammer his thanks. He looked at the punctured metal and said no more. During the period from May 1st through the 12th, our lie wing emerged without a single loss from every clash with the enemy. We had taken good advantage of the enemy pilots' failures to remain alert when airborne, and excellent tactics on the part of our formations chalked up an imposing string of one-sided victories. On May 13th, the damage suffered by my own fighter grounded me for the day. It gave me the opportunity to catch up on a month's mail delivered only that morning by submarine. My mother wrote that my brothers were now sharing Japan's battles. One had volunteered for the Navy Flyers School, but failed to meet their rigid requirements and had instead enlisted at the Sasebo Naval Base. My other brother was drafted into the army and already was on his way to China. He never came home. He was later transferred to Burma and was there killed in action. But the most eagerly awaited mail was, of course, from Fujiko, she wrote at length of the great changes which were occurring at home, and surprised me with the news that she was now working in her uncle's company, which had been converted into a munitions factory. Nowadays not one person should stay idle, the Prime Minister has said. He has told the country that even daughters, if they remain home without contributing to the war effort, will be drafted and sent to any munitions plant where their services are needed. So my uncle, in order to keep me with the family, hired me at once to work for him. I was amazed to realise that Fujiko, the daughter of such an eminent family, had to work in a munitions factory. It was hard to conceive of my mother's small farm without the help of my two brothers, and she had been forced to labour and found it difficult even when we were home to help. My cousin Hatsuyo had even more disturbing news. She wrote that her father had been transferred back to Tokyo from Shikoku. Several days after her return to the city, she witnessed the April 18th attack on Tokyo by American B-25 bombers. I know that you are in the thick of combat, she wrote and your successes against the enemy are of great comfort to all of us at home. The bombing of Tokyo and several other cities has brought about a tremendous change in the attitude of our people toward the war. Now things are different. The bombs have dropped here on our homes. It does not seem any more that there is such a great difference between the battlefront and the home front. I know that I, as well as the other girls, We'll work all the harder to do our share at home to support you and the other pilots who are so far away from Japan. Hatsuyo was still in school, but her afternoons and part of her evenings were spent with other schoolgirls working in factories, sewing military uniforms. The sudden change in the status at home was bewildering. My brothers in service, Fujiko working in a munitions factory, Hatsuyo in another factory. It was all so strange. Hatsuyo did not describe the enemy bombing in detail, even though it was the first time that our homeland had been attacked. Of course, we had received the news here at Ley much earlier, the same day, in fact. Officially, the government disclaimed any heavy damage, which seemed reasonable in view of the limited number of attacking planes.
but the attack unnerved almost every pilot at Lai, the knowledge that the enemy was strong enough to smash, that our homeland, even in what might be a punitive raid, was cause for serious apprehension of future and heavier attacks. I was still reading my mail when Warrant Officer Watam Handa approached me to request the loan of my wingman, Honda, for a reconnaissance flight to Port Moresby. Warrant Officer Handa was a new arrival at Ley, and a most welcome one. Although he had not yet fought in the Pacific, he was one of Japan's most famous aces from the China Theatre, with fifteen enemy planes to his credit. Since his return from the Asiatic mainland, he had served as a flight instructor at Tsuchiura. I saw no problem in letting Honda fly with him. Certainly he would be with one of our best pilots. Honda, however, had other ideas about the matter. Veteran ace or not, he growled at my orders. I'd rather not go, Saburo, he mumbled. I have been flying only with you and I don't want any changes now. Oh, shut up, you fool, I snapped. Honda is a better flyer than I am and has been flying a lot longer, you go. At noon, Honda took off with five other Zeros for a reconnaissance flight over Moresby. I was disturbed at Honda's reluctance to fly the mission and sweated out his return. Two hours later, five Zeros came in for a landing. Warrant Officer Honda's lead plane and four others. Honda's plane was missing. I ran all the way to the runway and climbed onto the wing of Warrant Officer Honda's Zero even before it stopped rolling. Where's Honda? I shouted. Where is he? What happened to him? Honda looked at me, misery on his face. Where is he? I screamed. What's happened? Honda climbed down from the cockpit. On the ground he took both my hands in his, bowed low, then spoke with an effort. His voice was choked. I, I am sorry, Saburo, he stammered. I am sorry, Honda. He, he is dead. It was my fault. I was stupefied. I couldn't believe it. Not Honda. He was the best wingman I'd ever flown with. Warrant Officer Handa turned his face away from me, staring at the ground, and began to trudge to the command post. I followed him, unable to speak, as he continued. We were over Moresby, he said in a low tone. We started to circle at 7,000 feet. The sky seemed clear of enemy planes, and I was searching the field for planes on the ground. It was my fault, all my fault, he murmured. I didn't even see the fighters. They were P-39s. I don't know how many, just a few of them. They came down so fast that we had no warning. We didn't even know they were on us until we heard them firing. I went over into a roll, as did Endo, my other wingman. When I turned around for a moment, I saw Honda's plane, which had been at the end of my trio, enveloped in flames. He drew the crossfire from the P-39s. I stopped and stared at him. Honda walked away. He never seemed to recover from the blow of having lost my wingman. Although he was an ace in China, warrant officer Handa had apparently lost his sure touch in the air. He had never fought the American fighters, which could outdive our planes by a considerable margin. Whatever had actually happened, Handa took personal blame for the death of my wingman. He was wan and pale for the remainder of his time at Ley. Finally, he contracted tuberculosis and was sent home. Many years later, I received a letter from his wife, she wrote. My husband died yesterday from his long illness. I am writing this letter to meet his last request, that I write and apologise for him. He never recovered from the loss of your pilot at Ley. The last words he spoke before he died were, I have fought bravely all my life, but I cannot forgive myself for what I did at Ley when I lost Sakai's man. When he died, Honda was only twenty years old. He was a strong man, in his actions on the ground as well as in the air. He was quick to fight, but was one of the most popular men in the Sasai squadron. I was very proud of him. His wing flying had been superb. I was confident that he was on his way to becoming an ace. For the rest of the day, I wandered around the base in a daze. I paid no attention to the rest of the men in the squadron who pledged revenge for the first pilot lost from our group since April 17th. To me, my greatest accomplishment in air battle was the fact that I had never lost a wingman. And now I had sent out Honda against his own wishes to fly with another man, and he was dead.
I could not help thinking that my other wingman, Yonikawa, might well be killed also. For long months, Yonikawa had faultlessly covered my fighter in the air. He had done so well by me that he was still without a single victory of his own. Honda had been more aggressive and had shot down several enemy planes. My mind was made up. Yonikawa must get his own victim on the following day, May 14th. I received naval aviation pilot Hattori as Honda's replacement. Before we took off in a flight of seven fighters for Morrisby, I told Yonikawa that if we met enemy fighters, he would fly my position and I would cover him. Yonikawa's face lit up with excitement. If I had known what was in store for us that day, I would not have arranged things differently. The Allied pilots, it appeared, had given serious study to the unexcelled manoeuvrability we enjoyed with the Zero Fighter. Tode marked their first attempt at new tactics. We saw the enemy planes over Morrisby, but, unlike their previous manoeuvres, they failed to form into a single large formation. Instead, the enemy planes formed in pairs and trios, and were all over the sky as we approached. Their movements were baffling. If we turned to the left, we'd be hit from above and the right, and so on. If they were trying to confuse us, they were achieving their purpose. There was only one thing to do, meet them on their own terms. I pulled up to Sasai's plane and signalled him that I would take the nearest pair of enemy fighters. He nodded, and as I pulled away, I saw him signalling the other four zeros into two pairs. We split into three separate groups and turned to meet the enemy. We rushed at the two P-39s I had selected, and I fired a burst at one hundred yards. The first Aero Cobra evaded my shells and winged over into a screaming dive. I had no chance even to get near him for another burst. The second plane was already rolling over for a dive when I rolled hard over to the left, turned, and came out on his tail. For a moment I saw the pilot's startled face as he saw me coming in. The P-39 skidded along on its back, then whipped over again to the left in an attempt to dive. He looked good for Yonikawa, who was glued to my tail. I waved my hand in the cockpit and rolled to the right, leaving the P-39 for my wingman. Yonikawa went at the Ara Cobra like a madman, and I clung to his tail at a distance of two hundred yards. The P-39 jerked wildly in a left roll to evade Yonikawa's fire, and Yonikawa took advantage of the bank and turned to narrow the distance between the two planes to about fifty yards. For the next few minutes, the two fighters tangled like wildcats, rolling, spiralling, looping, always losing altitude, with Yonikawa clinging grimly to the tail of the enemy plane and almost leaping out of the way whenever the P-39 turned on his zero. It was a mistake on the part of the enemy pilot to break his dive in the first place, he had every chance of getting away, but now with Yonikawa so close to him, the dive would mean an open and clear shot for the zero. From 13,000 feet, the two planes with me right behind them dropped to only 3,000 feet. The enemy pilot, however, knew what he was doing. Unable to shake the zero after him, he led the fight back to the Moresby Air Base and thus within range of the anti-aircraft guns. It was by no means a one-sided battle, for the P-39 pilot manoeuvred brilliantly with an airplane which was outperformed by his pursuer. The Aero Cobra and Zero looked like whirling dervishes, both firing in short bursts and neither pilot scoring any major hits. Soon it became obvious that Yonikawa was slowly gaining the upper hand. On every turn he hung a second or two longer to the tail of the P-39, steadily gaining the advantage. The two planes passed over Moresby and continued their running battle over the thick jungle growth. Hattori pulled alongside my own fighter and we gained altitude, circling slowly over the two battling planes. Now they were down to treetop level, where Yonikawa could use the Zero to its best advantage. The Aero Cobra no longer had airspace in which to roll or spiral and could only break away in horizontal flight. As he swung out of a turn, Yonikawa was on him in a flash. There was no question of his accuracy this time. The P-39 dropped into the jungle and disappeared. Yonikawa had drawn his first blood. A torrential downpour on May 15th meant a day of rest for all pilots, but the respite was short, 
for before daybreak on the 16th several B-25s swarmed over the field at treetop level, digging craters in the runway and shooting up maintenance facilities. For the second day in a row we remained on the ground. It would take the entire day merely to fill in the holes and patch up the field. We sat around in the billets, several pilots catching up on sleep, while the rest of us discussed the rising tempo of the enemy attacks. A bomber pilot joined our group. He had landed at Ley for refueling and was grounded after the attack and listened with interest to our descriptions of attacking the enemy bombers. After a while, he looked wistfully at the Zero fighters parked off the runway. You know, he said suddenly, I think my greatest ambition has been to fly a fighter, not these trucks we go around in. It's funny, he mused. We've been taking more and more punishment on our raids. Most of the men feel they'll never live to go home. I feel the same way. Yet, he turned to look at us. I would be satisfied if there was one thing I could do. We waited for him to continue. I'd like to loop that truck I fly, he added. He grinned. Can you picture that thing going around in a loop? One of the Zero pilots spoke up. If I were you, I wouldn't try it, he said softly. You'd never come out of a loop in one piece, even if you could get up and around into one. I suppose so, he replied. We watched him walk across the field and climb into the cockpit of a fighter, where he sat and studied the controls. At the time, we didn't know that all of us would remember this pilot for the rest of our lives. The day passed slowly, and that night Nishizawa, Ota and I went to the radio room to listen to the music hour which came over nightly on the Australian radio. Nishizawa suddenly spoke up. That music listen, isn't that the Dame Macabre, the dance of death? We nodded. Nishizawa was excited. That gives me an idea. You know the mission tomorrow, strafing at Moresby. Why don't we throw in a little dance of death of our own? What the devil are you talking about? Otter snapped. You sound like you've gone crazy. No, I mean it, Nishizawa protested. After we start home, let's slip back to Moresby, the three of us, and do a few demonstration loops right over the field. It should drive them crazy on the ground. It might be fun, Otter said cautiously. But what about the commander? He'd never let us go through with it, so, was the retort. Who says he must know about it? Nishizawa grinned broadly. We went off to the billet, and the three of us talked in whispers of our plans for the tomorrow. We had no fear about appearing over Moresby with only three fighters among the three of us. We'd shot down a total of 65 enemy planes. My tally was 27, Nishizawa had 20, and Ota had accounted for 18. We hit Moresby the next day with a maximum fighter sweep of 18 zeros, with Lieutenant Commander Tadashi Nakajima personally heading the formation. Nishizawa and I flew as his wingmen on the mission. The strafing was a failure. Every bomber on the field was hidden from our view. The story in the air was different. Three enemy fighter formations came at us over the field. We turned into the first group and took them in a head-on attack in the swirling air battle, 6P-39S, Two of them mine fell in flames. Several zeros broke from the battle to shoot up the field, which proved later to be their undoing. Two fighters, badly shot up, crashed on the Owen Stanley slopes during the return trip. After the dogfight, we reformed. As soon as we were in formation, I signalled to Commander Nakajima that I was going down in pursuit of an enemy plane. He waved his hand and I dropped down in a long turning dive. I was back at Moresby in a few minutes, circling above the field at 12,000 feet. The anti-aircraft remained quiet, and no enemy fighters appeared. Then two zeros came in at my height, and we fell into formation. Nishizawa and Ota grinned at me, and I waved back in greeting. We gathered in a formation with only a few scant feet between our wingtips. I slid my canopy back, described a ring over my head with my finger, then showed them three fingers— both pilots raised their hands in acknowledgement. We were to fly three loops, all tied together, one last look for enemy fighters, and I nosed down to gain speed, Nishizawa and Ota hugging my own plane. I pulled back on the stick, and the Zero responded beautifully in a high arcing climb, rolling over on her back. The other two fighters were right with me, all the way up and around in a perfect inside loop. Twice more we went up and around, dove and went back into the loop. 
Not a single gun fired from the ground, and the air remained clear of any enemy planes. When I came out of the third loop, Nishizawa pulled up to my plane, grinning happily, and signalled that he wanted to do it again. I turned to my left. There was Ota, laughing, nodding his head in agreement. I couldn't resist the temptation. We dove to only 6,000 feet above the enemy field and repeated the three loops, swinging around in perfect formation. And still not a gun fired at us. We might have been over our own field for all the excitement we seemed to create. But I thought of all the men on the ground watching us, and I laughed loudly. We returned to Ley twenty minutes after the other fighters landed. We told no one of what we had done. As soon as we could get together by ourselves, we broke into loud laughter and whoops. Ota howled with glee, and even the stoic Nishizawa slapped our backs with enjoyment. Our secret, however, was not to remain ours very long. Just after nine o'clock that night, an orderly approached us in the billet and stated that Lieutenant Sasai wished to see us immediately. We looked at each other, not a little worried, we could receive serious punishment for what we had done. No sooner did we walk into Sasai's office than the lieutenant was on his feet, shouting at us. Look here, you silly bastards, he roared. Just look at this. His face was red and he could hardly control himself as he waved a letter in English before our faces. Do you know where I got this thing? he yelled. No, I'll tell you, you fools. It was dropped on this base a few minutes ago by an enemy intruder. The letter read to the lay commander, we were much impressed with those three pilots who visited us today, and we all liked the loops they flew over our field. It was quite an exhibition. We would appreciate it if these same pilots returned here once again, each wearing a green muffler around his neck. We're sorry we couldn't give them better attention on their last trip, but we will see to it that the next time they will receive an all-out welcome from us. It was all we could do to keep from bursting out with laughter. The letter was signed by a group of fighter pilots at Moresby. Lieutenant Sasai kept us at ramrod attention and lectured us severely on our idiotic behaviour. We were ordered specifically never to stage any more flying exhibitions over enemy fields. It was a good joke and we enjoyed every minute of our dance macabre over Moresby, None of us knew that night, however, that the next day was to be a true dance of death, executed without aerial histrionics. Seven zeros from our wing escorted eight bombers for an attack on Moresby. Hardly had we reached the enemy base when at least eighteen fighter planes plummeted upon us from every direction. This was the first defensive battle I had ever fought. We were hard-pressed even to defend the eight bombers from the swooping attacks of the enemy planes. Although I drove several fighters away from the bombers, I failed to shoot down any planes. Three Allied fighters fell to the other pilots. The bombers, meanwhile, released their missiles none too accurately, and then shakily swung into their turn to head for home. We saw a P-39 plunge with tremendous speed into the bomber formation, but could not move in time to disrupt the attack. One moment the sky was clear. The next the Aero Cobra was spitting shells into the last bomber in the flight. Then it rolled and dove beyond our range. The bomber streamed flame. The airplane seemed familiar as I closed in to watch. It was the same Mitsubishi which had landed at Lei. Its pilot was the one with whom we had talked in the billet. The flames increased in fury as the bomber nosed down and skidded wildly. It lost altitude quickly and seemed on the verge of going out of control. At 6,000 feet it was only a matter of seconds. The flames were engulfing the wings and fuselage. Suddenly, still blazing fiercely, the nose lifted and the bomber went into a climb. I gaped at the plane in astonishment as its pilot started to draw a loop, an impossible manoeuvre for the Betty. The pilot, the same one who had told us he wished to loop in a fighter, hauled her back and up. The bomber went up, hung on its nose in a half loop, and then burst into a seething ball of flame which blotted it out entirely. The flaming mass fell just before it struck the ground, a violent explosion shook the air as the fuel tanks went off. The three months of May, June and July were filled with almost constant air battles. It was not until after the war that I discovered that our lay wing was the most successful of all Japanese fighter plane operations against the enemy, and that our continued successes were by no means repeated with such regularity elsewhere. Lei was nothing less than a hornet's nest of fighter planes to the enemy. Despite its position as a major base for our bombers and for surface shipping, not even Rabaul figured so highly in the destruction of enemy aircraft as we did during the four months from mid-April to mid-August. 
we flew what was then the outstanding fighter airplane of the entire Pacific Theatre. Our pilots enjoyed a clear-cut superiority against the enemy, many of them having gained their greater experience through combat in China and through the rigid and exacting training requirements of pre-war Japan. It was not surprising, therefore, that the enemy suffered such grievous plane losses against the Zeros which flew from Lei. To us, however, it seemed that the courage of the pilots and crews who manned the B-25 Mitchells and B-26 Marauders was deserving of the highest praise. These twin-engine raiders lacked the firepower and the armour protection of the rugged flying fortresses, yet time after time they flew against Lei and other targets minus the fighter escort our own high command deemed indispensable for the survival of bombers. They always came in low, anywhere from 1,500 feet above the ground, to such a low level that they were actually slicing through the top of tree branches, as we saw more than once. They combined with their courage the highest piloting skill, and it was unfortunate for their ability that their airplanes proved no match for the manoeuvrable Zero fighter. Nevertheless, on more than a few occasions, their formations endured the very worst our fighters had to offer as they fled after their attacks. They were undaunted. They continued to come, continued to hit us with everything they had. Day and night their bombs slammed into the lay base, and their gunners strafed anything which moved. Their morale was marvellous, despite the terrible toll we exacted of their ranks in the late spring and summer of 1942. On May 23rd, seven Zeros caught five B-25s over Lei and sent one into the sea 30 miles south of Salamaua. The following day, six bombers returned to Lai. Unfortunately for their crews, our island warning net sighted them far from Lei, and eleven fighters stormed the hapless bombers, burning and shooting down five, and badly crippling the sixth. I flew in both interception missions, and the records of Imperial Headquarters credit me with three bombers shot down on those two days. The tempo of attacks increased as May drew to a close. For the first time on May 25th, four B-17s attacked with an escort of 20 fighters. Over the towering Owen Stanley Mountains, all hell broke loose when 16 Zeros plummeted into their ranks. Five enemy fighters went down, but the fortresses escaped. Three days later, five unescorted B-26 returned to La. I chalked up another victory. On June 9th, I sent two more B-26 crashing into the ocean. The days seemed to blur into one another. Life became an endless repetition of fighter sweeps, of escorting our bombers over Moresby, of racing for fighters on the ground to scramble up against the incoming enemy raiders. The Allies seemed to have an inexhaustible supply of aircraft. A week never went by without the enemy suffering losses, and yet his planes came, by twos and threes and by the dozens. Through the passing years, many of the details of these battles have faded, despite the help of a religiously kept diary, but several episodes stand out clearly. Unforgettable was the slaughter of May 24th, when an alarm of incoming planes threw Lay into an uproar. Six standby planes were already off the ground when the rest of us, clutched the sideboards of the swaying truck which brought us from our billet to the runway, reached the field. We were airborne without a moment to spare. My own fighter cleared the ground even as a stick of bombs tore the runway apart directly behind me. At least eleven Zeros were airborne by the time six B-25 completed their runs and turned to flee for Moresby. Nishizawa and Ota were the first to reach the enemy planes, and they each hit one bomber, raking the Mitchells with cannon fire. In a few seconds, both B-25 were enveloped in flames. They crashed just beyond our airstrip. The rest of us jumped the four remaining bombers, which, by excellent evasive flying, dodged our firing passes and reached the open sea. All eleven fighters winged in hot pursuit of the enemy. Off Salamaua, we pressed home the attack. Again it was a case of poor formation flying on the part of our pilots. Every man seemed to think the battle was his own, and raced in against the bombers without regard for his fellow pilots. Zeros banked sharply to evade ramming other fighters, and more than one pilot rolled desperately to evade the fire of another Zero shooting blindly at the bombers. Once they were over the water, the B-25 dropped to the deck, skimming not more than ten yards over the waves. Their tactics were sound, we could not dive too steeply, and we were denied climbing passes. 
One Zero, screaming down in a dive at the lead bomber, misjudged his distance and plunged at full speed into the ocean. I caught the last bomber in a firing pass from above its tail. The B-25 held a straight course, and it was not difficult to concentrate my fire into the fuselage. In moments the air was filled with fire and smoke as the bomber reeled to the left and exploded as it hit the ocean. At sea level height the B-25 were almost as fast as the Zero fighter, and we were hard-pressed to keep up with the bombers and also go into our firing passes. Three enemy planes were still in the air when the six standby fighters turned for home, out of ammunition. Lieutenant Sasai chalked up the fourth bomber, and we kept hammering at the two surviving planes. I got the fifth when, with its gunners apparently out of ammunition, the B-25 made a run for home after breaking away from the other remaining plane. The Mitchell took 1,000 rounds of machine gun bullets in its fuselage tank and exploded flame from the right wing. It skidded wildly and hit the water, where it exploded. It was a good day, five out of six planes definitely destroyed. Several days later, I was involved in a new aspect of air combat, and one which proved even after all our battles sickening. I caught a lone B-26 over Ley and pursued the enemy plane over the sea, shooting up the fuselage and right wing. The marauder burst into flames over the water, but before it crashed, four men bailed out. Each landed safely on the sea, and the next moment a small, bright life raft popped up. As I circled the raft, I saw that the men clung to its sides. Since they were only two miles from the Ley airbase, it was only a matter of time before a boat would pick them up and make them prisoner. Suddenly one of the men thrust his hands high above his head and disappeared. The others were beating fiercely at the water and trying to get into the raft, sharks. It seemed that there were thirty or forty of them. The fins cut the water in erratic movements all about the raft, then the second man disappeared. I circled lower and lower and nearly gagged as I saw the flash of teeth which closed on the arm of the third man. The lone survivor, a big, bald-headed man, was clinging to the raft with one hand and swinging wildly with a knife in the other. Then he too was gone. When the men on the speedboat returned to Ley, they reported that they had found the raft empty and blood-stained. Not even a shred of the men was visible. On May 20th we fought the highest air battle in our history, when Commander Nakajima led 15 zeros into the enemy zone at Moresby at a height of 30,000 feet. It took us an hour and twenty minutes, fighting for altitude all the way, to reach Moresby from Ley. We relied on our height to give us the advantage of surprise, and were astonished to encounter an enemy formation several miles ahead of us at the same altitude. I was doubtful of the Zero's ability to perform aerobatics at this height. My personal record height with the Zero was 37,720 feet, achieved with an oxygen mask and an electrically heated jacket. At that height the plane was extremely sluggish at the controls and refused to climb another foot. Consequently, it seemed unwise to fight with the Zero at a height of 30,000 feet. There were ten enemy fighters, apparently P-39 of a new design. I led the attack and was engaged at once. The fourteen other Zeros met the head-on attack of the remaining planes. The controls were sluggish in the thin air. As the other plane came at me, I tried for an advantageous position from which to fire. We seemed almost to be moving in slow motion. I kept edging closer to the other fighter in a tight spiral and manoeuvred in for a quick burst. I yanked the stick over hard too hard. Something seemed to crash into my chest and the oxygen mask slipped down to my chin. Afraid to release the controls because I might spin out of control, I fumbled helplessly in the cockpit and then everything faded into darkness. I had blacked out it seems that when a man is concentrating with all his power on a certain action, even a loss of oxygen fails to prevent him from carrying out to some extent what he had originally planned to do. I felt, even when I seemed to fall into unconsciousness, that my hands had frozen on the controls and kept the plane descending in its spiral manoeuvre. For when my head cleared and vision returned, I was at 20,000 feet, the plane still under control. I snapped out of the turn instantly, for it was likely that the Aero Cobra had followed me down and was setting me up for the kill. But the other plane was also in trouble. Possibly the pilot had turned too sharply at that height and had spun out, or perhaps he too suffered from lack of oxygen. 
Whatever the cause, there he was, at twenty thousand feet with me, spiralling around slowly. I shoved the throttle forward and headed for him, even as he came out of his seeming stupor. The next instant his wing was up and around, and the P-39 came at me with all guns blazing, but the Zero was back in its element. I came out of a turn with the Aero Cobra above and to my right, one quick burst with my cannon and the plane broke in two. Only one other pilot registered a victory that day. Ota managed to bring down another P-39. The following day I got my first enemy fighter without firing a shot, in a battle which was exactly the opposite of the maximum height encounter. This time, on May 26th, we fought a wild running duel at treetop level. We were in a group of 16 zeros when we encountered a strange enemy formation, four B-17 flying in a column, with about 20 fighters flying in echelons of two and three planes grouped around the fortresses. We were below the enemy planes and were able to catch them almost unawares in a steep climbing attack. I flamed one P-39, and then the sky erupted into a swirling mixture of fighter planes clawing at each other in individual dogfights. Most of the enemy fighters broke for the deck, pulling away from our own planes. A few, however, were forced to pull out of their dives by higher peaks, and went into evasive manoeuvres, as we hoped they would. I dropped to the tail of one P-39 directly over the jungle. The pilot was fearless. He seemed to brush trees and rock outcroppings as he turned and dove, banked and climbed with me on his tail. Every time he climbed, turned or rolled, I cut down the distance between our planes. I snapped out a burst, which the Aero Cobra evaded by rolling violently to the left. The next moment the pilot dove again, directly into a tortuous valley, flanked closely by towering crags. Before I knew it, I was within the dangerous mountain pass, hot on the tail of the P-39. There was no time to concentrate on firing. I had all I could do to stick to the enemy fighter, which banked and wheeled in its hair-raising escape between the peaks. In no time at all I had forgotten my original purpose. I was drenched in my own sweat. The motor seemed to thunder louder and louder in my ears, and the peaks and rocks swept perilously close to the zero as I rushed by at several hundred miles an hour. Then the mountain caught up with the enemy plane. The P-39 came out of a tight turn, and without warning faced a tremendous overhanging rock cliff which blocked our path. Instantly the pilot jerked the Aero Cobra upward and rolled to get his wings out of the way. It was not enough. The wing hit and the fighter snapped around, then exploded with a terrifying roar in the canyon. I saw the pieces hurtling by me only vaguely. No sooner did I see that rock than I hauled the stick back with every ounce of strength in my arms and kept it back. The Zero whipped upward in a violent loop, and for an eternity of a split second it seemed that I would meet the wall just as the Aero Cobra had. But the Zero responded perfectly, and I cleared the cliff by what appeared to be a matter of inches. It took me a few minutes to calm down and to wipe away the perspiration that drenched my face. I eased off on the throttle and climbed slowly, trying to relax, to shake off the tension. That was my thirty-seventh conquest, and although I had not personally destroyed the plane, this was one of the most harrowing air battles I'd known. I found out later that day that Nishizawa and Ota had both done almost exactly the same thing, chasing two P-39 down a mountainside and whipping away in almost impossible rolling turns as the fighters in front of them smashed and exploded. That night the billet roared in jubilation over the day's events. During the last week of May, the Lay Wing carried out maximum effort fighter sweeps of the Moresby area, and in three days of wild air fighting scored tremendous successes against the Allied planes. Accordingly, Moresby was judged ripe for a knockout blow. On June 1st, 18 bombers from Rabaul, escorted by 13 fighters from Lay and 11 others from Rabaul, tried for the finishing stroke against the vital enemy bastion. We did not consider it possible for the Allies to mount any strong fighter opposition after the preceding battles, but we were wrong in this estimate. Twenty fighters roared into the big Japanese formation. Once more it was a one-sided fighter-versus-fighter battle. Seven enemy fighters fell in flames, one from my guns, but they accomplished their purpose, scattering our bombers and destroying the accuracy of their aim. On the return to Lei, one of our bombers dropped out of formation, Weaving erratically in the air, I dropped down with five other fighters to fly cover. 
The bomber was a flying shamble. Bullet holes and gaping openings from cannon shells riddled the wings and the fuselage and gave it the appearance of a sieve. I pulled up close to the nose and stared into the cockpit. Even at that distance I could see the blood on the instrument panel and on the seats. It was a miracle that the plane flew at all. The pilot and co-pilot lay sprawled on the deck in pools of blood. The flight engineer struggled with the unfamiliar controls. I could not see the other four crewmen. Two turrets were smashed, and the men who had manned them were either dead or wounded. Only the flight engineer, fighting to keep the plane aloft, appeared unhurt. Somehow he kept the plane flying, rolling and weaving drunkenly until he reached our lay airstrip. The man was doing a magnificent job, apparently. He was flying from his memory of watching the pilots in the air. That is difficult enough, impossible for most men without pilot training. But with a badly damaged bomber, it was virtually impossible. Now that he had reached Lai, the engineer was at a loss as to what to do. He could keep the bomber flying. But landing, with its long, steady approach and lowering airspeed, was another matter. The crippled airplane circled slowly over the airstrip, going around and around as the engineer studied the narrow runway below him. There was no way to help the unhappy man in the cockpit. We closed in and tried to guide him down, but whenever he took his eyes off the controls, the plane lurched dangerously. Gradually he lost speed as he descended. There was no use in remaining aloft until his fuel ran out. The bomber circled over the water, skidded badly as it turned, and then approached the runway. I held my breath, he couldn't make it. With speed down, the plane rocked badly in the air and began to slide into a stall. It would crash at any moment. Then a miracle occurred. The pilot staggered to his feet. His face was white and caked with blood. He leaned heavily on the shoulders of the engineer. For those brief, vital seconds of the approach, he shoved the wheel forward and regained speed. With its wheels and flaps up, the cripple soared down and touched the runway. A flurry of dust burst upward as the airplane skidded wildly. In a moment it smashed two fighters into wreckage, then lurched to a halt and broke in two. We landed immediately afterward, taxiing up to the wreckage, which miraculously failed to burn. The pilot who had forced himself to his feet only a minute before was unconscious. The co-pilot was dead. The engineer who had flown the cripple home was so badly wounded in the legs that he had to be carried from the airplane. Both bombardiers were badly shot up. The bone of one man's arm jutted through broken skin, and both were caked with their own blood. The two gunners were semi-conscious, also blood-soaked and seriously wounded, but were clinging to their guns with iron grips. It was the first time we had ever seen with such intimacy the terrible power of fighters' weapons. Death in the air had never been close. Even those men who died in burning planes were remote and distant. A man either came home or he didn't. But now we saw it for what it really was. The fighter sweeps continued, and during the next two days we shot down three more fighters. But no one at Ley realised that our steady victories paled by contrast with the catastrophic defeat of a major Japanese task force at Midway on June 5th. We knew of the battle, since Tokyo had announced a major victory for our fleet forces. Imperial headquarters minimised our losses as insignificant. For the first time, however, we had doubts as to the accuracy of the reports. Our reasoning was simple enough. We knew Midway was to be invaded and occupied. If our fleet had withdrawn without carrying out that occupation, then something unforeseen had happened. We did not learn for a long time to come that four of our largest and most powerful aircraft carriers, along with 280 planes and most of their pilots, as well as thousands of men who formed the warship's complements, were lost. From June 5th through 15, a strange lull settled over the New Guinea front, broken only by a single raid against Ley on the 9th. I added two B-26 bombers to my score. On the 16th, the air war exploded with renewed fury. It was a field day for our fighters, when 21 Zeros caught three enemy fighter formations napping. We hit the first group of 12 fighters in a massed formation dive which shattered the enemy ranks. I shot down one plane, and five other pilots each scored a victory. The remaining six enemy fighters escaped by diving. Back at high altitude, we dove from out of the sun at a second enemy formation of twelve planes. Again we struck without warning, and our plunging pass knocked three fighters out of the air. I scored my second victory in this firing run, 
A third wave of enemy planes approached, even as we pulled out from the second diving attack. Some two dozen fighters came at us as we split up into two groups. Eleven Zeros dove to hit a climbing formation, and the others met us at the same height. The formations disintegrated into a tremendous free-for-all directly above the Moresby Air Base. The enemy planes were new P-39S, faster and more manoeuvrable than the older models. I jumped one fighter, which amazed me by flicking out of the way every time I fired a burst. We went around in the sky in a wild dogfight, the Aero Cobra pilot running through spins, loops, immelmans, dives, snap rolls, spirals and other manoeuvres. The pilot was superb, and with a better airplane he might well have emerged the victor, but I kept narrowing the distance between our two planes with snap rolls to the left and clung grimly to his tail at less than twenty yards. Two short cannon bursts and the fighter exploded in flames. That was my third victory of the day. The fourth, which followed almost immediately after, was ridiculously simple. A P-39 flashed by in front of me, paying attention only to the pursuing Zero, which zoomed upward in a desperate climb, firing as he went. The Aero Cobra ran directly into my fire, and I poured 200 rounds of machine gun bullets into the nose. The fighter snapped into an evading roll. I was out of cannon shells, and fired a second burst into the belly. Still, it would not fall, until a third burst caught the still rolling plane in the cockpit. The glass erupted, and I saw the pilot slam forward. The P-39 fell off into a spin, then dove at great speed to explode in the jungle below. Four enemy fighters in one day, that was my record to date, and it contributed to the greatest defeat ever inflicted on the enemy in a single day's action by the lay wing. Our pilots claimed a total of 19 enemy fighters definitely destroyed in the air. On our way back to the field, Yonakawa kept breaking formation. He went into wild rolls, climbed, dove, dropped in falling leaves. He cavorted all over the sky, flying circles around my fighter. I understood why when he pulled alongside my own plane and held up two fingers, grinning broadly. Yonakawa was no longer the untried fledgling. Now he had three planes to his credit, he bubbled with exuberance. He flew upside down, waving both hands around in the cockpit, then he flew directly over me, under me, and went through a wide hesitation roll around my fighter. He was like a kid showing off. He finally flew on my wing and held the stick between his knees. Still grinning, he waved his lunchbox at me and started to eat. His exuberance was infectious. I waved four fingers at him and then opened a soda bottle. He pulled his out from his lunchbox and we drank a happy toast to one another. The day of victory was not over yet. Hardly had our planes been refuelled and our ammunition belts replaced than a spotter report came in. Ten B-26 were on their way to the base. They could not have chosen a worse time, for nineteen fighters were off the ground before the marauders reached Ley. We failed to shoot any down, but damaged most of the planes and caused them to scatter their bombs wildly. During the pursuit away from Ley, ten P-39 came after us over Cape Ward Hunt, apparently in reply to the bomber's distress calls. One Aero Cobra went down in flames. Ley went wild with the victory that night. All the pilots were given extra rations of cigarettes, and the mechanics swarmed over us to share our jubilation. Even better news was the word that we were to receive five days' leave at Rabul. The cheers of the pilots shook the surrounding jungle. I was particularly relieved at the news of the five days' rest. Not only was I tired from the almost daily fights, but my mechanics wanted several days in which to work on my fighter. They called me over to show me the bullet holes in the wings and fuselage, and my stomach dropped when I saw a row of holes running directly behind the cockpit. They had missed me by no more than six inches. In 1942, none of our fighter planes carried pilot armour, nor did the Zeros have self-sealing tanks, as did the American planes. As the enemy pilots soon discovered, a burst of their 50 caliber bullets into the fuel tanks of a Zero caused it to explode violently in flames. Despite this, in those days not one of our pilots flew with parachutes. This has been misinterpreted in the West as proof that our leaders were disdainful of our lives, that all Japanese pilots were expendable and regarded as pawns instead of human beings. This was far from the truth. Every man was assigned a parachute. The decision to fly without them was our own, and not the result of orders from any higher headquarters. Actually, we were urged, although not ordered, 
to wear the parachutes in combat. At some fields, the base commander insisted that chutes be worn, and those men had no choice but to place the bulky seat packs in their planes. Often, however, they never fastened the straps and used the chutes only as seat cushions. We had little use for these parachutes, for the only purpose they served for us was to hamstring our cockpit movements in a battle. It was difficult to move our arms and legs quickly when encumbered by chute straps. There was another and equally compelling reason for not carrying the chutes into combat. The majority of our battles were fought with enemy fighters over their own fields. It was out of the question to bail out over enemy-held territory, for such a move meant a willingness to be captured, and nowhere in the Japanese military code or in the traditional Bushido samurai code could one find the distasteful words prisoner of war, there were no prisoners. A man who did not return from a flight was dead. No fighter pilot of any courage would ever permit himself to be captured by the enemy, it was completely unthinkable. Nevertheless, it was acutely discomforting to discover a row of bullet holes only inches from where I sat. That night I received confirmation of my four kills for the day's fighting. This was by no means unique in the Imperial Navy, and I know of a score of other naval flyers who matched or exceeded this number of planes shot down in a single day. This gave me a total of 43 victories,